Welcome to A Case for America. I am Austin Hepworth, here along with Michael Hepworth, and we are talking today about the 16th Amendment. As a reminder, we always come from the perspective that law is a good thing, and that it can pull us out of anarchy, but that too much law can hurt if it leads towards tyranny or the law deciding all things. And so throughout American history, the 16th Amendment deals with taxes, one of the fun, uh, you could maybe say necessary evils of government. Um, And so the 16th Amendment says, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. So one of the things to understand about the 16th Amendment is that the federal government in the past was supposed to keep taxes apportioned among states and population. And so there was a notion that it shouldn't be able to tax certain states more or maybe punish certain states more by making them raise more taxes. Um, you know, or the people there, it was generally supposed to be treated equally based on population. And taxes in general were supposed to be direct taxes. So this meant that the federal government up through 1913, when this amendment was ratified, was generally getting taxes from excise taxes or tariffs. A tariff is a tax imposed on an import or export. So if a good's leaving the country or coming into the country, the federal government can say, you have to pay a certain amount to get that good in or out of the country. Tariffs generally increase the price of products. They're very direct taxes on products. And they were hurting the southern and western states that were in the business of importing or exporting quite a bit more. Um, The other type of tax is an excise tax is one like the federal government charges on a gallon of gasoline. It's just a set amount charged per gallon sold. So it's kind of like a sales tax, but sales taxes are paid as a percent of the sales price, whereas an excise tax is just a fixed amount that's paid per unit sold. So gas taxes, cigarette taxes, alcohol, those can have excise taxes on them, or you're just paying the government a set amount if you're going to buy that gallon or that pack of um, either gas or cigarettes. And so again, prior to that time, the U.S. government had been using mainly excise taxes and tariffs to fund its operations. But there was a growing push for the government to be involved in social good type scenarios where they were, you know, where people wanted them to be able to um, help the poor or run mental institutions or increase their footprint in schools or different things. Um, And the government needed more money. And again, there was some states that felt they were getting hit harder with the import and export type tariffs. And so Congress proposed the 16th Amendment um, in 1909, I believe, and it took four years or so for the states, for enough states to ratify it and have it come to be. And with that, one other thing to know is that there was an income tax that had been put out by the federal government prior to this in the 1890s that was struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. And one of the reasons was because the Constitution required this apportionment among states and population, and the income tax wasn't doing that. It was left slightly questionable whether they could do an income tax or not um, if there wasn't a direct apportionment requirement. But this amendment just basically addressed both, said you can't tax incomes, and it doesn't have to be based on apportionment or representation or anything else. So we're at the place now where the income tax is pretty set in America, although there still are a fair number of people that claim the tax is unconstitutional or that it's wrong that the government tax income. There are people that push for abolishing the income tax system. They want a national sales tax, for example. Uh, Maybe some have some other proposals. But there is... I'd say maybe a growing chorus of people who are frustrated about 
the income tax. And I think one reason there's frustration is because some people feel like they pay much more to things than other people do. And maybe it feels a little bit like the government picks and chooses. I know I have eight children and I do have one now that's old enough to not be a child tax credit, but I have seven children still on the child tax credit system. And, you know, meaning I get a certain amount reduced for my federal taxes each year. And that makes it so I pay very little in the way of federal income tax. Whereas someone else that doesn't have the children, maybe they're not spending that money on kids, but they're spending it on taxes to the federal government. And that doesn't feel fair to everybody. Um, where even people, I hear more and more, a number of people that are older say, look, I don't have kids. I shouldn't have to pay into the tax system and support public education because I don't have any kids there. That should be paid for only by those that have children there. And, and again, it's, I think there's a lot of discussion continuing in our society around taxes. But I do think that one reason why the income tax gets talked about so much, why people want to do away with it, is because it has varying tax rates that it imposes on people based on the amount of money they bring in. And so people pay different amounts. Um, so Michael, kind of curious to know some more details on the you know, tax rates, margins people were taxed at kind of when they were um, taxed at those levels throughout American history. Yeah, something that I don't think is well understood is that the U.S. tax rate is extremely progressive, meaning it changes based on income and it changes widely. Um, so if you know, you're making under a certain amount, you'll get taxed at this rate, and the more you make, the more you get taxed, and those rates uh, differ quite a bit. But Looking at it over history, if we go all the way back to 1913 when this was first instilled, um, well, let's just look at the top, what we call the top marginal tax rate, right? meaning the top amount, if you were making the most money uh, in America, this is what you would have been paying for, for taxes. Um, and that, that sat at about 7%. So the top earners in America were paying 7% of their income in 1913. Pretty low, uh, not a very high rate. It, it, jumps pretty quickly. 1916, it was 15%. 1917, it was 67%. So in a matter of two years, we went from 7% to 67% to the top earners. Um, we, it, it fluctuated, and then we got into the years of World War II, uh, and we were 79%, we were 81%. 1944, we hit 94%. So the top earners in America were paying a 94% tax rate on their income. Um, there's some discussion about uh, if they were actually paying 90, 94% of their income because they can shift funds around to not look like income, to invest it in business, do different things, maybe there's tax deduction. Um, but the, the tax rate for the top earners in America was 94%. Again, it continues to fluctuate till today it sits, as of 2022, it sits at about 37%. Uh, so top earners in America pay 37% of their income to federal government. Um, that's, and we can uh, convert that into um, what percent maybe of the federal income uh, is is due to the top earners. So if you look in America, the top 1% of earners, as of 2021, this was people making over $682,000. That that was the top 1% of earners. This is an average, uh, excuse me, this is adjusted gross income. So those making that amount, paying, they ended up paying roughly 46% of the federal income tax. So the total amount the federal government brought in via income tax, 46% of that was the top 1%. If you drop down to the top 10% of income earners, this was everybody $170,000 and over, just to gross income, they were paying some 76% of the, the revenue that the federal government was generating via the income tax. So most of the tax is being paid by um, the very highest earners in America. 
In fact, the bottom 50% of earners in America paid about 2.5% of the federal income tax. So the, I don't know what the population that comes out to be, but if you were making under roughly $50,000, you either weren't paying any federal income tax at all, uh, or you contributed just a little bit. Uh, it kind of depended on if you were married, if you had children. Um, there's a lot of things that go into what your adjusted gross income is and what kind of credits you can get from the government uh, to whether you end up paying a tax or not. And I think some people get confused about this because they'll look at a paycheck and they'll see a uh, federal tax and they'll see money come out of their account. Um, but generally, it's, it comes back as a refund at the end of the year. And in many cases, for the lowest earners in America, you can actually get back more money than you paid to the federal government based on uh, tax credits and things like that. Um, so just because it's coming out of your paycheck doesn't mean you're actually paying it. If you file, uh, you generally get that back. Sometimes you get more than you paid back. So the breakdown again is top 1% are paying 46% of the taxes, bottom 50% of earners are paying less than 2.5% of all the taxes. Um, so it's that just kind of highlights how the, the progressive nature of the tax that we have in America, that we have, there's a lot of discussion around um, people paying their fair share. Uh, and today, it's the the goal is to make the people who make more money pay more, and that's happening. Um, the uh, what is it here? The uh, the percentage of the federal personal income tax paid by the wealthiest one percent has consistently increased. If you go from 1980, the top one percent in America were paying about 20 percent of the federal income tax uh, through you know, 2022, they're paying almost 50%. So just over those 40 years, the percentage of the top 1% are paying has increased uh, by over double. Uh, so it's very progressive tax, uh, really hammers the top end far more than the bottom end, doesn't really hardly tax anybody in the bottom 50%. Um, and so yeah, those are just some of the, the number breakdowns as far as marginal tax rates. Yeah, I think it's a little wild to hear that at one time it was 94%. Um, and also to look at how quickly it escalated on, oh, you know, vote, is, vote in income tax. I'm sure when people were voting on it, they were thinking 1% to 10% maybe. And then to have it quickly get up to 67%. Um, to me, it's one of the things to understand about government is that if you don't put checks and balances in on it, it will quickly push the balance of whatever power you give it, it will take. And to me, we need to be very wise if we're going to give the government the power to tax. I actually believe we should put limits on how much it can take um, because a 94% tax rate. I don't I don't personally see anything appropriate about that. And it's you know, it's it's interesting we look at the the lower income people and say they're not paying much of anything of the income tax side. But even at the lower end, they're paying um Medicare, they call it the FICA taxes, Medicare, Medicaid, they're paying social security. And there's a hidden tax that very few people realize is there until you're self-employed and you suddenly get hit with it. But that amount that your employer deducts from your paycheck, even if you're not paying income tax, you're still losing the FICA and the Social Security from it. Um, they're taking that from even the poor people and are the ones that, you know, a lot of America doesn't want to tax. Again, there are some in America that want to tax them that talk about this flat tax but the employer has to pay the exact same amount so the, the total is you're supposed to pay 15 percent of your paycheck to the federal government for medicare medicaid type things um, for social security and what they do to make it so it's a little more palatable for employees 
is they say, oh, you only have to pay 7.5%. And so that gets deducted from your check, but your employer has to match that and pay an employer tax of 7.5%. If you're self-employed, you don't have an employer paying the other 7.5%. And so suddenly you have, um, you suddenly have to pay the full 15% essentially. And it's expensive. You're in $100 and you're paying 15 in taxes. That's before income taxes to the federal government, before income taxes to the state government. Those aren't part of the income tax. They're just levied on it. If your employer didn't have to pay the 7.5% for you, you know, so if your employer pays you 100 bucks, you lose $7.50 to the federal government. Your employer pays an additional $7.50 on top of that to the federal government. And so the employer's cost, your cost to the employer is $107.50, excluding benefits and all the other things. So in essence, when an employer looks at how much employee, they have to factor in that tax. If that tax wasn't there, your employer could, you could have a 7.5% raise. They'd be able to pay you quite a bit more. Um, but we've kept it that way so long in America that we're so used to and accustomed to our employer being required to be a tax collector. They collect a lot, a lot of the government's taxes for them. And I think to me, one of the biggest things or maybe injustices I see with income tax or the way that we're currently doing the tax system that's twofold. One is there's no limit on what the government can take currently. We didn't put in any checks or balances there. Um, but we also are conscripting, we're forcing business owners, individuals to be tax collectors in order to run a business or do something. And I don't believe that there's any basis in our governmental system anywhere to force someone to be a tax collector in exchange for the right to work. To me, the right to work is a fundamental right. And I think it's very wrong that we say, oh yeah, employers, you have to collect sales tax, you have to collect income tax, you have to collect social security tax, and then send it along to us. And you have to do it without getting paid for it. And if you don't do it, you can go to jail. Um, to me, it's a serious, serious problem in America that makes it, again, it kind of ruins the check and balance approach because you're not gonna go be angry at your employer for withholding taxes you would be at a tax collector that came around and said, hey, you got to pay me. Um, but the fact that the government used to have to enforce the tax collection side was one of the big checks and balances that kept it in place. When the federal government had to hire people to go collect taxes, it made it so that if they're going to collect taxes, they had to be somewhat reasonable. Now that you can just impose it on your grocery store or your employer to collect the sales tax or to collect the income tax, it's we can't be angry at those people and then they put this insulating you know this middleman in between it insulates them from the heat or the frustration of people paying these taxes and it really in my opinion circumvents one of the checks and balances that should exist that it should only be government officials collecting taxes as individuals we shouldn't have to be conscripted as a tax collector in order to do business I hold that position strongly. Um, others don't necessarily, but I remember Utah tried to impose a sales tax on services. And there's a lot of issues with that. Um, but one of the biggest was I just went, look, I don't want to be a tax collector. I don't want to be withholding money and sending funds along to the government just in exchange for the right to work. That feels wrong to me. It felt very wrong to me. And Utah ended up people in Utah were frustrated enough with the sales tax on service. It didn't end up happening, even though the Utah government really tried. Um, but again, on the tax side, I think we have to look at one, is the tax policy fair? Is it appropriate based on society? I think most people in society, from a majority perspective, are comfortable with the progressive tax, where the richer get taxed at a higher percent than the poor. Um, I'm not saying that makes it right or wrong. I'm just talking about where we're at as a society. But I do think that there are some people who are really pushing for a flat tax. They want a sales tax of 10%. Um, a lot of people believe it will greatly simplify our tax code. 
Um, to those people, though, I I don't personally know that it will because one of the reasons our income tax code is so complex is because we're trying to figure out what income is. You know, if I, as a business, earn $100 by selling things, but I have to pay out $98 to employees just to get the thing made and sold, have I really earned 100 Because if, if they charge me 4% tax on that, I wouldn't make any money. I'd lose money um, because I'd only end up with $2 left at the end. And so the government says, oh, yeah, sure. You can deduct expenses before you calculate income. Um, and so then they would say, oh, well, you get to pay taxes on that $2 you earned because that's your net income. But there's so many ways to categorize that, to deal with that. Oh, well, you know, what if I say I owed myself rent and the rent got paid here and then this company had this expense and, you know, it goes on and on and on. And companies have become so, so aggressive and so smart about the thousands of different ways to classify income, the thousands of different ways to create expenses to do things that the tax codes become very complex to deal with that. So a lot of people say, well, I don't want complex tax code. Let's make it simple. Let's just do a sales tax. There you go. Well, have you looked at the sales tax side of things? Because it's pretty complex still. Because what happens is a company, let's say instead of paying employees, they um, they get $100 of income in. They go buy some still. And then they melt the still down and make it into parts. Those parts are then sold to somebody who then puts those parts into a car or a computer or whatever, and then sells it and sells it. And there's always a point at which you have to create a code about, well, who's the final consumer? Who pays the tax? Because if if you're paying a sales tax every time that the material changes hands, every time a part changes hands, our supply chains in America are just enormous. And there's a lot of complication around dictating, well, this is when it's final, this is when it's not. And when we talk about the billions and trillions of dollars that we do, the companies make, they have huge incentives to figure out you know, more and more ways around even what constitutes a product for sales tax purposes and how to deal with those types of things. Consumers will have the same. Um, you know, even here in Utah, <laughs> You see a lot of you see a lot of Montana license plates here in Utah, and one reason is because Montana doesn't charge a sales tax in order to register your car there. So you can go purchase a car in Montana and register it there and not pay a sales tax. Now, technically, Utah says if you park it here, you're supposed to pay a use tax on it, um, but Utah doesn't have an enforcement mechanism set up for that, and Virtually no one I know of pays use tax. Maybe there's some businesses, but very few people. And so a lot of people have Montana vehicles because it saves them on sales tax. Um, and and so taxes certainly drive behavior. If we create a certain type of tax, people will get very aggressive about figuring out how to get around it. One of the things is if the U.S. imposes a sales tax, one of the ways to get around it for a lot of people would be to buy goods in other countries. Um, and then they have to start trying to figure out, you know, tariffs, tracking things, whatever else. And and so you would probably see an uptick in people making purchases in Mexico or Canada, depending on the rates that the U.S. imposed if they were to do a sales tax. So mainly the point I'm saying with that is it's not a perfect system where you can just say, oh, I'll just do one thing and I'll solve all these problems. Each system has its own problems inherent in it and is part of it. But one of the interesting things to talk about with taxes is how our money is being used. And I wanted to show if you're um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this. But if you're not, you can look these up. You can look up U.S. debt visualizations uh, with cash. There's a number of sites that have these. And it's pretty fascinating to see. We're going to go to a site at visualcapitalist.com. 
And so first they share with us that 1 million seconds equals 12 days. 1 billion seconds equals 32 years. 1 trillion seconds is 32,000 years. Our current national debt stands at over $30 trillion. Um, and when we think about having a million dollars, I think most Americans would still love to have a million dollars, even though it's a little bit easier for people to get nowadays than it was when I was a kid. But still, the thought of being a millionaire sounds kind of cool for a lot. That's, again, in the terms of seconds, that's 12 days. If you get up to a billion, you're at 32 years. But a trillion is 32,000 years. So just very significant differences. So looking at it visually, if you go to the $100 bill, the site shows one. Then it shows a stack of $100, $100 bills, which is 10,000. Then you can go to a million. And a million makes a little cube of um, these these stacks of $10,000 bills. To earn $1 million is equal to 92 years of work for the average human on Earth at the time this one was made. If you go to $100 million on a pallet, um, a, a pallet, a normal size pallet of wood, if you think of a pallet that things come on in the grocery store or in Sam's Club or Costco, you can stack $100 million on that, which would be 100 of the million dollar cubes. That goes up to, if you go to a billion dollars, that takes 10 pallets of $100 bills. And this visualization shows a guy standing next to it um, to show it's almost as tall as him. If you were to go on, though, to a trillion, one trillion dollars in this visualization is, it would be in a field of pallets longer than the White House. Um, with some wings coming off of it, some wings of the building coming off. They show a 747, and it's way bigger than a 747. Um, but if you look at this visualization here of one trillion, a billion dollars is um, one of these rows in it. You have to have a thousand of these rows of 10 pallets to get a billion dollars. A semi truck can haul $2 billion on it with these pallets that size. Um, and you can just look and see 1 trillion. If you go to, at the time this one was made, this was 20 plus trillion. They show the skyscrapers that would exist of the pallets of um, $100 bills. You have the they show the Statue of Liberty there, looking up kind of in dismay with its light hanging down. So this was in 2017, where the national debt was at. And this shows how many pallets of $100 bills that would take to pay it off. So the money the government spends has grown. And if you look at the national debt, this is a chart that if you go back to 1913, when this uh, income tax passed, you couldn't even see the line on here. Now, granted, the line starts at a trillion dollars, but you couldn't see it. It barely becomes visible here around 1920. It starts, and then it goes up. You know, we have this period with World War II where it's, it shot, shoots up quite a bit, and then it hangs out pretty steady, starts going up in the mid-70s, and then in the 80s just kind of starts taking off. And it goes and goes, and even until we get to, this graph goes to 2020, but under President Trump, the national debt increased a substantial amount. There were obviously other presidents where it increased a substantial amount. Here on the graph, we have some very large increases as well. Um, but we are spending quite a bit of money. Now, one of the other interesting facts, though, as we talk about national debt, is to look at the debt to GDP ratios, meaning how much debt do you have compared to how much you make. Japan has the highest, they're at 264%, where they have a lot of debt compared to how much they're making, followed by Venezuela. The United States comes in at number nine at 129%. 
Now, there are countries that operate without this much debt. Countries like Kuwait are at 2.9%, Cayman Islands 4.5%. Um, you get even to Russia, they're at only 17.2%. And, and so it's, it's one to look at to say, is our income tax helping us out? Or do we just believe that, oh, well, I heard that there's a rich guy, you know, like Elon Musk, he's got a lot of money, so we'll be able to pay it off. Um, and we just keep spending. And I have wondered if when we disconnected, I feel like when we disconnected taxes from excise taxes and imports, exports, tariff type taxes, we disconnected it in a way from the GDP. Obviously, it was still based on income, so supposedly it should have been tied to it. But it felt like something happened that made us more willing to spend money and just believe that there'd be money to pay it off somewhere. Um, but Michael, curious your thoughts on national debt, where we spend our money, and maybe some of the numbers associated with some of those things. Yeah, it's a really interesting topic because um, I don't think we fully appreciate how debt can affect our, our freedom, our ability to act as a, as a nation. And if you know your debt gets to a point where whoever you're indebted to comes calling for it, uh, what options do you have as a nation and how does that affect your freedom? And so one of the, one of the reasons I think we'd like to focus on this a little bit is we're trying to make sure that our country can remain with, uh, free with liberty. We want to make sure that we're not beholden to somebody to the point that we can't uh, pay up if needs be. And when we're looking at the amount we owe uh, and how today we're running 120 plus 130 percent of our GDP, that's that's saying take all of America's gross domestic product and just apply it to our national debt and you won't pay it off. And obviously, you can't do that because people wouldn't survive. All companies would go under. But so just. Just looking at that, it seems to be a huge issue for liberty, for our ability to um, remain free as a country. Uh, and to your point about sometimes we look at income tax and say, well, let's just increase that. There's a lot of people with a lot of money. Let's just get them to pay more and they'll be able to pay off uh, a lot of these issues. But we can kind of look at the federal government. They're collecting right now. They're collecting about two point six trillion dollars in income taxes. And remember that the top 1% is paying almost 50% of that. So the, the, the richest people in America are paying 50% of the 2.6 trillion. Um, that comes to about half of America's total revenue collected via taxes. So income tax pays about 52% of America's total revenue to the federal government. So if you wanted to double income tax, to make all of America's revenues come from in income tax, um, you could think about what kind of impact that would have on individuals. If already the top 1% is paying 50% of the taxes, where are you gonna get the rest of that money from? Um, it's kind of hard to see how that would actually work. If the government's bringing in some $5 trillion a year, but their budget is somewhere in the six to $7 trillion right now, um so per year we're spending roughly our income tax amount more than the federal revenue and so to try to cover that you could try to double the income tax uh, i don't think that would be without its really negative impacts to businesses and individuals alike um if you want to know kind of where it's going like how how does the federal government spend this money we can just look at this year. So far this year, the federal government has spent some $2.1 trillion, is according to the federal government's website. Um, and 25% of that has been sent to the Department of Health and Human Services. So that's going to be management of Medicare, Medicaid, and other things. 23% um, is sent to the Social Security Administration. So the two big spenders are Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And then 19% went to the Department of the Treasury. I haven't been able to track down what that's for. I'm not sure what the Treasury is spending 20% of our total spending this year on. And then 13% goes to the Department of Defense. 
And then after that, it's all kind of trivial spread out among other departments. Most of it is health and human services and social security and defense up and down this year. It's a little bit down. Um, we talk about cutting spending of the federal government. Not cuts to most things aren't going to make much of a difference unless they are cuts to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, we are paying roughly a third of the U.S. tax revenue is going to Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and so that's that's more than it's almost as much as the income tax revenue itself just goes to Medicare, Medicaid. And so just trying to cover that, plus all the other expenditures for really large federal government, it, it starts to become a really daunting task. If you look at our, so we, we have a national debt of $34 trillion in America right now. And if you look at just the interest on that debt, this is the debt interest, it's running at about $753 billion, which is a third of our income tax revenue. So you could take a third of the income tax revenue and just apply it to the interest that we owe on our national debt. Um, it just escalates really quickly to a, an unsolvable issue. We are a very wealthy country. We're bringing in large amounts of money. We talk about if you use $100 bills, what a trillion dollars looks like. And we're bringing, the federal government's bringing in $4.6 trillion, $5 trillion, and we can't even make a debt, a dent in our national debt. Um, it's it's a concerning issue because it really affects our ability to be free and maintain our freedom. Um, the other interesting part about this is the federal government goes through audits each year. They, they like to audit their departments and their spending. And many departments don't do very well on this, particularly the defense, the Department of Defense. Uh, kind of an interesting historical note. September 10th of 2001, the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld um, reported that his department was unable to account for roughly $2.3 trillion worth of transactions. So Department of Defense is given uh, a massive budget each year. $2.3 trillion would be the federal income tax net revenue this year. Um, and they, they, they're not able to account for $2.3 trillion worth. Uh, the, the Pentagon has failed audits six times in a row. Um, up until 2018, it had never even completed an audit. But since that time, it has just failed each one of their audits. And every year it has a large um, dollar value of assets that are unaccounted for. For example, in the most recent audit, the Pentagon was able to account for just half of its $3.8 trillion in assets. So that's $1.9 trillion in military assets that's unaccounted for. So not only are we spending a lot of money for a very large government, in many cases, the government is unable to be accountable to the people for how that money is being spent. Uh, so we're, we're getting into large concerns about our ability to stay free given our national debt. And we can't even figure out where the money is going. It's really difficult to try to pay down debt to increase revenue if you can't properly track your spending. So there's, there's kind of a lot of numbers there, a lot of things going on. Um, but I guess to put it mildly, it's kind of a mess in how we handle the money. A lot coming in, far more going out, and we're not even sure of where it's all going. Yeah, it's there's a piece of me that says if we want to have a properly balanced government you know go to that balance that we often talk about then anyone that receives or spends government funds needs to be accountable for it there has to be accountability there in my opinion and it's interesting in a state like utah and i don't know how this is in all states i haven't done research on this yet but in a state like utah we have a state auditor that's elected and we get to uh, select the individual that's going to go audit utah state and its spending and use of funds and utah is mainly dominated by the republican party and utah utahns vote for a republican to go audit the republicans and i'm fascinated at how short-sighted that is in the sense of yeah it's good to have a an auditor and i think it's even 
okay to say let's appoint you know have people vote on them uh, perhaps but as people we should be recognizing that whoever we appoint to audit should be the opposite of the party in power or an independent of it at least because if we are you know if you're on wall street and you're going to go ask a company to audit itself it's completely taboo they don't audit themselves everyone knows you need an independent auditor to get accurate information and yet in government we say oh yeah we're fine if a republican audits a republican sure it'll give us something good and you look at these things like the pentagon failing audits there's no repercussion there's no accountability to them and to be able to just say oh yeah we've got 1.9 trillion in assets somewhere that means there's missiles laying around there's tanks there's warplanes who knows what and they can't properly catalog where it's at they just have stuff but we don't have records for it kind of who knows who cares um and it's a mess but we're talking insane levels of money at 1.9 trillion dollars is just a crazy amount of money and for whatever reason we as america have accepted the notion that oh well they just don't know where they spent that money you know right before 9 11. oh yeah 2.3 trillion dollars you don't know where you spent it can you imagine if your mom gave you a million dollars and you just said oh no idea where i spent it mom can't even document it with a credit card receipt it's just gone um i think that your mom would be quite angry if you couldn't even tell her a little bit of it but it's an interesting notion because uh, one thing that's happening right now is I I put it out the way I phrase it and it, you know there's other ways to look at this so I may not be correct in this but the way I phrase it is the government's buying our freedoms from us when the government imposed a income tax that it no longer had to apportion among the states equally it could say hey Utah we'll give you a bunch of money we took it from people in California but we'll give it to you if you agree to do X Y or Z and so pretty immediately with the Department of Education um, the federal government didn't have constitutional authority to regulate education and so they just said oh we're getting all this money from the states now hey states you want some back we'll give you some money back we took it from your people your citizens but hey we'll give you some back if you just sign on to our program but you don't have to it's not a law um so you don't have to have the money we're not going to make you take it but it's here for you and if you don't take it we can just give it to all the other states so they'll have really good education you won't and that apportionment requirement to me was the founders were very wise in understanding that there's a lot of power that comes to the federal government if it can take money from one state and then send it to another and it can start to buy freedoms because then it can just say mm, it's not a law you don't have to do it but if you want your money back this is why the hoops you have to jump through to get it and they're they're taking that to a new level where it's not just um dictating to states what they have to do now businesses we saw during covid that wanted to continue to receive medicare or medicaid funding so hospitals and others they had a mandate come down that said you have to force your employees to get vaccinated some people were okay with that um, but from my perspective that goes very against the liberty balance of saying hey everyone has to be able to decide for themselves vaccinations to me were something that no matter how good you feel they are aren't um, they certainly have helped a number of people in america from what i can see and they've helped sicknesses have gone down um, you know i don't think people are dying from things like tetanus but vaccinations can also hurt people every vaccination has known side effects there are people that get injured by them there are people that die from them and forcing someone to say you don't get to decide in this you don't get to put up your concerns we're just going to put it on you um, but to a business they were told you have to force your employees to do this if you want to continue to receive medicare or medicaid funding and then they go it's not a law it's just we won't give you any more medicare or medicaid funding we won't pay you if you're not going to do it and that really put a lot of businesses in a hard spot put a lot of people in the medical world in a hard spot um 
here in Utah, and this is happening in a lot of states too, this isn't just something with Utah, but Utah last year passed, they call it Utah fits all bill, um, where they're saying, oh, since you homeschool or you're a private school, you're not in the public school system, you're saving our state, you know, they, the math they claim is $9,500. And so we're gonna give you 8,000 of that because we'd spend it anyways if your kids were in school. So here's $8,000 homeschool or private school or go spend it how you want on your kid's education. Now, when I saw that, I said, well, pretty quickly, the government's gonna be telling you what you have to do as a homeschooler or private schooler in order to qualify for the funds. And you know, the legislative reps and others said, no, no, no way. You just get the money. This is without oversight, spend it how you want. And I said, I don't even feel that's that's morally correct. I feel if you're going to get money from the government, you should have to account to it because it's taken from somebody. It's coming from taxes. And it's a public trust at that point. You need to tell people how you're spending it. And already just a year later in Utah, there's bills proposed in the Utah legislature to audit to require accountability for use of funds to do a bunch of different things. And on the money side, like we see with when federal income tax started, these things, you know, it doesn't take long because um, money, the government, people, greed, if you have the power to take money from people and give it to someone else, there's a lot of interest that can come into that very quickly. And something that I also talk about is to say that, oh, so sorry, I guess to go back quickly, when I say the government's buying our freedoms from us, if you homeschool and take these government funds, there will come a time when the government will absolutely say you have to do X, Y, or Z in order to get these funds. Um, and then a lot of people say, oh, I just won't take them at that point. But you have to understand that when the government comes in and starts putting money into something, it absolutely changes the whole economic structure of that you know, mini economic environment. When the when government comes in and puts money into healthcare, healthcare costs go up. Healthcare costs is way more expensive now. If you go into private schools and the government just says, oh, here's $8,000 to everyone that wants to join a private school, we'll just give it to you. Well, what happens to private schools? All their tuition goes up by $8,000. That's what will happen. And suddenly private schools will be that much more expensive. So when it comes time for you to opt out, there's no longer an option of a private school to go to that you can afford anymore because they're all eight thousand dollars a year more. Um, and so suddenly your kids won't have private schools to attend. And government money, when it's put into a scenario, changes the economics of it. It's not a it's not a true supply and demand type scenario. And it will always change those economics. And so the, the second point that I talk about often is this I call it a deadly mix of socialism and capitalism. Something that's happening in our law currently is that the um, uh, the capitalist side of business can put billions of dollars into research and development. And if they can invent something that makes people a little bit safer or um, reduces mortality rates in a surgery or different things, and then pretty quickly, businesses are required to use the new method and the new machine because if they don't, it'll be considered negligent and they can be sued for something that happens as a result of not using this new technology that's come out. Now, again, this doesn't happen instantaneously. There is a time period kind of where things can incorporate into the economy and then at some point you're now negligent if you don't do it. But what this means is that instead of businesses choosing to adopt something because it makes the most economic sense or delivers the most value or whatever it is they're striving to do, they're choosing to adopt it to avoid a lawsuit. They don't want to pay out millions to billions of dollars in a lawsuit. And so it's the socialist principle of, oh, we want to protect everyone. So you've got to be you know, using the highest standards, latest and greatest. But when we do that, then corporations can say, oh, I don't have to compete anymore. 
I just have to go out and make something new that, you know, improves things a little bit. Even if I spend billions and billions of dollars in research, and then I can recoup the money because people kind of have to sign on. Um, in addition to just the threat of lawsuits side, there's a lot of legislation where they're mandating that businesses or people do use certain products or services to access the government. And it's becoming more common for the government to say, oh, yep, if you want to talk to us, you got to go through this web portal, pay the people their fees, do their side of it. And to me, when socialism and capitalism are allowed to mix like they have here in America, there's not a checker balance on it. And we just see these research and development costs just ballooning and exploding. And even this is a little bit of a tangent, but to look at healthcare, healthcare in America is crazy expensive. What's happening in America, um, there's plenty of other things happening too. This isn't the only thing, but this often isn't talked about. And to me, it's an issue of how we approach um, things here is that a company that puts billions of dollars into developing a new drug, they have to recoup that billions of dollars through the drugs they sell. Other countries around the world will set caps on what companies can charge. These socialist countries with socialist health say, we'll only pay this amount for it. And generally, that's set out a little bit above the production cost. But it's not the production cost that they're trying to recoup necessarily. They have to recoup that, but they also have to recoup the, the research and development costs. And so that burden, the whole recouping of the research and development costs falls largely on America because these other countries cap the prices. And so America essentially is carrying the research and development costs for most of the world in healthcare. Um, because we have this kind of funny mix of socialism and capitalism. Now, if America just became socialist and just said, oh, we're going to cap everything and only pay a certain price, then the research and development is going to plummet because there's no place to go to recover your R&D costs. And maybe we don't need advances in healthcare. Maybe we figured it all out, but it seems like we're sicker than ever. Um, and to me, the way to get back to a healthy healthcare system is to get back to a place where People have a choice of, you know, do I take on the latest and greatest or not? Do I not force the companies to be more judicious about how they spend money, about what they're researching and developing? Um, and I say that just because it goes back to this notion of government spending, where when you have this notion of an unlimited checkbook of just, oh, I'll just raise taxes next year, um, then Pentagon says, I, I don't know what happened to $2.3 trillion. Someone spent it. You know, maybe it was mills, maybe it was planes, maybe it was missiles, I don't know. You know, even when the Chinese weather balloon, supposed weather balloon that was then a spy balloon, came across America, um, I think that the military used a $100,000 missile to shoot it down. All I had to do was pop a balloon. And they chose a missile that was cost $100,000 to produce. And and I look at things like that and I go, yeah, that's without some level of accountability, without some level of checks and balances there, this problem will continue. You know, it's not just a tax problem. We have to have checks and balances on the tax side, on the budgeting side, and accountability on the receipt of funds, the receipt and use of funds for those who spend it, even people like I save in homeschool groups and private school groups. And I say that I'm a homeschooler, um, meaning we homeschool our kids. But from a moral perspective, if you're going to take public money, I believe that everyone that takes public money should be accountable for how it's spent and used. Um, because that's just part of the moral code of a nation to say, you took it from us, you took it at gunpoint, essentially, you forced us to give it to you on threat of arrest. And you need to be accountable for it. And that's, again, my perspective on it, but I do think it goes back to what Michael talked about with the reason we're, we're looking at these things is because liberty very much hinges on budgets and finances. No nation can rise above its financial scenario, essentially. We have to have good finances and good housekeeping. 
And to do that, we have to have accountability and checks and balances in our government. Um, but Michael, curious if you have any thoughts on any of that or anything else to share there? Yeah, just more on the uh, side of us as citizens. I think the checks and balances on the government are super important. Uh, and I think we need to look at ourselves as citizens and say, what's the proper way to manage finances personally? And then how does that carry over to what we're asking the government to do? Too often what I'm seeing is um, it, people, groups, they want to solve a problem. They want something for themselves. And they say, well, let's go to the government, and get the government to pay for it. Um, but you're looking, you're, you're pushing a problem off onto another entity. Uh, you're asking somebody else to foot the bill. If you did that for yourself, do you, do you walk around to your neighbor's houses and say, hey, I'd really like this new thing. Can you give me some money for it? For the most part, we don't do that. Um, there's some degree of personal responsibility we take for earning and paying our way and doing the things that we need to do for our families. Um, and if we just shove it off on the government, what we've, we've said is, well, I'm not going to go around on my neighbors and ask. I'm going to make the government do that or make the government force my neighbors to pay for it because it's something I think is really important. Uh, but we need to have some personal accountability in ourselves. When uh, we went through the, the years of uh, the COVID restrictions put on by the government, um, they said, hey, lots of these businesses need to shut down, but we're going to pay. We're going to give you some money because you don't have work now and we'll pay some money now, maybe we'll pay some more money later. And there's a number of checks sent out and different incentives, different tax breaks. And uh, there were a lot of, there was a lot of funding sent to um, individuals in the community that they thought were underserved or to schools. Um, and when all of that came to an end, when people were back at work years later, and some of these programs were ending, I'm reading reports now about kind of the panic that people are going through. Now they're not getting the money they used to have to send their kid to daycare. Their daycare isn't funded like it used to be because they're running out of their COVID money. Um, and so they're asking local governments, they're asking federal governments to step up and re-up these programs. And it's interesting how something that was necessary because we didn't have work or the ability during COVID now becomes necessary when that's not a problem anymore. Um, there's, there's no restrictions on being at work due to COVID-19, and yet people feel that they need this money for their daycare, they need this money for, you know, what have you. And it's amazing how quickly we become dependent on these things. And we need to look at ourselves and say, what is the principle of um, taking care of yourself? Where, where am I saying, well, it's just easier if I take the money from the government? I remember talking to a number of people who got the stimulus checks during the COVID-19 time. And all people that had jobs, they did very well. Uh, they happened to have children. And so they got fairly decent sized COVID checks from the government. And they just love to talk about all the cool things they were buying or the vacations they were going to buy. Um, just a really interesting view on, hey, I don't need this, but the government gave me some money, so I'm going to use it. Uh, I think we as, in, as society in this country need to take a long look at ourselves and say, what are the principles we're living by? If we can't live by correct principles for ourselves, we're not going to be able to uh, demand that of our government. When we go to the government and ask for accountability and checks and balances, it's going to, uh, it's not going to reach their ears because they're looking at the way we live our lives every day. And we're not going to really uh, mean it. We're going to still want those payouts from the government. We're still going to want a lot of that help that we think we need. When it used to not be necessary, we didn't used to need money for COVID, and now suddenly we do, even though COVID isn't an issue anymore. Um, it's just something we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves and say, how are we managing our own finances? Are we making the hard choices? We don't get all the cool stuff, uh, but we're doing our best to be self-sufficient so that we can ask our country to be self-sufficient as well. Yeah, and I think it's a great point to look at the moral responsibility side of it. Um, it was interesting with the COVID relief funds. Japan watched America and America sent them out and Americans spent it. We were very spendy with it. Like, oh, sweet. Let's go buy a new purple mattress. Let's go, you know, do whatever trips, whatnot. And so there was a thing that helped delay the economic impact of COVID. 
you know, obviously we're filling it now with inflation. Government can't just send you money without there being some pretty serious inflation. Um, but Japan then sent out their COVID relief checks and it didn't stimulate the economy in Japan because the Japanese said, oh, I have some extra money. I need to pay down my debt. And they didn't go buy new things. They mostly paid down their debts. And um, and so it is interesting to see that the way that we approach things personally does have a pretty big impact on things. Um, currently, our national debt is at an all-time high, but our consumer debt as well, personal debt. And the American household debt is staggering. Crazy amount. We're not even talking about I don't even think this includes the amount that people are indebted on their homes, just on credit cards, um, other consumer type debt scenarios, you know, just in the trillions and trillions of dollars. And yeah, and so we have to say, does debt bring liberty at a personal level, at a community level, at a societal level? And the answer is no, it never does. Debt is a form of bondage. And when we're in debt, we have to answer to somebody else. And so if we want true liberty, we have to really work to get our debt balanced, get our spending balanced, to get accountability into government. But to do that, Michael, to your point, we have to exercise the same self-restraint as individuals. We don't need to spend all the money. We don't need to buy the newest and greatest things. We should be working to get out of debt. And then once we do, really pushing to get our government to implement similar methods and systems of accountability to say, no, we don't go there. We only spend what we have, you know, except maybe in a time of war. I could see a time of war as maybe justifying borrowing if it were necessary. Um, but we really need to focus on that and say, at what point do we rein in the government? At what point do we rein in ourselves? At what point do we not need that brand new cell phone and we can just make do for a year or two? Um, and we often kind of laugh and say those don't matter, but those questions really do matter quite a bit because these things do make or break us. It's the little things, the purchase upon purchase, the line upon line that adds up to create this national debt. Even though we can look at a few things and see the main drivers in the national um, expenditures. There's millions more things in there. The government's just spending money on because it can. Every one of them adds up to something. Um, and it's the same in our personal lives. So every one of our expenditures adds up to something. And it becomes quite a bit of money after some time. I remember just in law school alone, and I don't remember the exact numbers, so I'll be wrong in putting it out, but they showed if you use student loans to purchase a cup of coffee each day at Starbucks, how much it would cost you by the time you paid off your student loans based on the interest incurred on those and things versus the law school is just saying, just get your coffee here. We have free coffee. Maybe it doesn't taste like Starbucks, but we have free coffee. And if I remember, I think it was about $80,000 difference between the interest and things that came in on just your cup of coffee each day. Um, but again, that number probably off, but it's, it was a significant amount and the little things we do each day, they add up, they compound, um, and the little things we do as a nation, the big things we do as a nation, they add up and compound as well. And these are principles that we definitely need to push checks and balances in, but at both our national and personal level. Um, and so I do believe it's possible for America to reduce its national debt and to get down to a healthy level. Um, but I do believe it's going to take a few years. This isn't a quick fix. And we need to really buckle down and um, be willing to say, no, this is, this is worth our liberty to forego some government programs. You know, instead of maybe taking money from the government for additional 8000 for homeschooling, maybe we just say, hey, I'm apply it to the national debt. Let's, you know, do different things. And, um, and there's a lot of ways I believe we could do less spending in government. And so that's a whole nother discussion. 
for another day. But ultimately, the 16th Amendment does specifically allow a tax on income. I still get people that ask me, isn't the income tax unconstitutional? And they've read something online. There's things that circulate online that say, yeah, income tax is unconstitutional. The government doesn't have the power to tax you. And I know people that say, yeah, I don't file tax returns um, because the government doesn't have the power to do that. I don't have to do it. And I go, hmm. the government absolutely has the power to tax. It's an amendment to the Constitution. It's very express that the government can tax income. And you live in a society that has a government. Governments only operate with taxes. Uh, you're you're going to lose that in court. And the people that I do know that get challenged or caught by the government, they lose. And it's not fun. So if you're listening, wondering if the income tax is constitutional, it is. It's in the Constitution directly. Um, something we have to pay. But that isn't to say that we shouldn't work for proper checks and balances, just to say it is a part of our constitutional system here. So we appreciate you guys being with us today um, as we discuss income tax and some of the things there. Um, but really hope you also will think about the auditing side, the accountability side, and potential solutions to help make that a stronger check and balance in our government. So that if there's entities like the Pentagon filling those audits, there's something that kicks in that starts to hold them accountable for that. Um, but thanks for joining us. And we look forward to discussing these topics more with you next week as we talk about America and the great country that it is. Thanks so much. Thank you.